Thank you again, everyone, for coming to our March to Stanovite. My name is Sophie Pitaluga, and I am the student marketing manager at the Office of Sustainability, filling in for Calandra Waterslake, who's our sustainability director, who unfortunately can't be here. Um, but I'm super excited to introduce our guest speaker, Caleb Rogers, because he is an alum um, of William & Mary, as you all may know. Um, but yeah, so before we get started again, just wanted to have some announcements. So feel free to grab your lunch or something to munch or sip on if you haven't already. And then we can get right on started. Um, so before we begin, I would like to read out the land acknowledgement that William & Mary has. Um, so William & Mary acknowledges the indigenous peoples who are the original inhabitants of the land our campus is on today. And so this includes the Charon Haka, Nataway, Chickahominy, Eastern Chickahominy, Mattapanai, Monacan, Nansamund, Nataway, Pamunkey, Patawamanik, Upper Mattapanai and Rappahannock tribes. And we pay our respects to the tribal members of the past and presence. So if you're looking for the land acknowledgement, you can, and more resources, they can actually be found on the American Indian Resource Center website um, that William and Mary has. So I encourage you all to check it out if you are interested. And I wanted to briefly go over how William and Mary defines sustainability because it's broader than most people would imagine. Um, so this definition recognizes the interdependence of human and natural systems, looking to ecological principles as models, um, as well as creating healthy and happy and resilient communities and a healthy economy that recognizes ecological limits. So as you can see, based on this image, um, sustainability is really more than surviving or continuing, especially in the context of the environment, but rather it's about thriving um, in the context of the environment and society and economics. And if you're looking for ways that sustainability is applied, we have a university sustainability plan and a climate action road, roadmap that features the sustainability development goals um, that the UN puts out. And you can find all of this information on our sustainability website. And just for some quick updates before Caleb takes it away, uh, tonight we are co-sponsoring a climate and justice teaching, which is this one day uh, global teaching on climate solutions and justice. And there will be several speakers from a variety of offices and departments. So it should be really interesting and exciting. And there will absolutely be at least one topic of interest for almost everyone. And you can register at tinyurl.com dash William and Mary Climate Justice 2022 if you're interested in attending. And finally, um, I'd like to remind everyone of our upcoming Sustainabite in April with Elizabeth Miller, who is also an alum and currently the Associate Director of the Office of Community Engagement. Um, and she's going to be talking about advocacy and citizenship during Earth Week, which would be exciting. And you can, again, register for this event on our website. And then today, what everyone has been waiting for is our guest, Caleb Rogers. Um, quick intro, Caleb will likely introduce himself a little bit more and talk about his experiences and accomplishments. But Caleb is a William & Mary alum from the class of 2020 um, with degrees in public policy and history. And I'd say he put those two majors into play when he ran for city council um, in Williamsburg as a second semester senior, which was really exciting and won. Um, and in addition to being a city council member, Caleb, I just saw that you got promoted to sales director at Voltus, which is this company that's working on the transition to clean energy, which is so cool. Um, so again, he's an incredibly accomplished individual. And now I'll leave it to you, Caleb, to share a little bit more about your personal and professional journey um, that brought you to where you are now. Cool. So, all right, well, Sophie, thank you so much. Um, for everyone on the call, I'm going to refrain from using slides. I figured if you're a current student, you see them enough. There won't be any quizzes if you are, but it looks like there's some alumni and I might, uh, Izzy, Steve, Gerald be sending a quiz afterwards either way. But as Sophie said, uh, I am Caleb. I have the fortune of working full-time at a clean energy company, part-time on some environmental efforts with Councilman Ted Maslin, also on the call for the City Council of Williamsburg. And actually because of Sophie and because of the sustainability newsletter, I had the fortune of doing some volunteer work for an organization called the Global Youth Climate Network. So I'm excited to get into those. I promise I won't drone on too long. I first wanna say a shout out and happy birthday to our moderator, Sophie. 
Thank you for spending any bit of your birthday with us. I hope there are plenty of uh, celebrations in store and planned for the evening. <laughs> but starting off with the full-time role, um, as Sophie mentioned, I work at a remote clean energy company called Voltus. Voltus is unique in that it has no headquarters. So there isn't a East Coast regional area that's close to me. Everybody who works at Voltus works at the company from the comfort of their own home, but we do try to get together in person relatively often. The basis of the company is providing demand response services to large energy users in the US and Canada. Energy is a really interesting way to think about the uh, need to decarbonize our society because we're all very used to the lights turning on and that's been very much reliant on fossil fuels over the past decades. So this energy transition that we need to bring in of bringing on more assets of solar or wind is helped through demand response. And here's how. Demand response is a way for large energy users to reduce some of their electrical usage in times of high demand on the energy grid, and in doing so, actually be paid by the energy grid for doing so. The reason that a manufacturer might shut down operations to provide a little bit of energy onto the grid is because they are paid handsomely for doing so. And the grid has these programs and decides to pay energy users because in the past, there have been instances of severe weather or something as simple as a downed tree on a power line that causes some local instability on the energy grid. It's very helpful to have what are called demand assets in store so that the grid can, instead of solving the imbalance from the supply side by literally making more energy, usually through what's called a peaking power plant, mostly powered by coal or natural gas, instead solve that from a demand side in having large energy users curtail some of their usage, usually for a few hours at a time. And if it works out financially, if you're able to shut down for an hour and make more in payments from that hour than you would in the production of any kind of material, then it makes sense to do so for a company's bottom line. That's one of the reasons why I really find Voltus and our work interesting is certainly everyone who works at the company is doing so because they, they care about climate change. They want to be able to work full time towards it. But if I'm calling an external company, uh, which I was earlier, our pitch might not be do this because it's sustainable and it's good for the earth and you should. Our pitch very well might be do this because you can get paid. So it's an easy way, a kind of capitalist way, you might say, to get people quickly signing up for demand response to provide their flexible energy load to make sure that the grid has that backup so that you don't have to rely on those fossil fuel powered peaking power plants and you're going to cause less brownouts or blackouts and instability on the grid. Voltus as a company is has been growing very quickly. It's only started uh, about five years ago, but we've gone up to around 200 employees now, and we have a planned SPAC process that's ongoing at the moment with a ideal DSPAC in the summer, I think July of 2022. So we'll be listed on the NASDAQ, I think is VLTS, which is all very exciting. And, and the company will certainly be hiring soon. There, if you might know anyone in operations or sales or if someone with an energy experience, please feel free to refer them my way because I know we'll be recruiting very heavily. As far as my work in particular, I'm on the sales side of Voltus. So Sophie's right, had, had the fortune of getting promoted yesterday into the sales director role. This will change my functionality some, but I'll still be focused on the mid-Atlantic energy grid, which is called PJM. That acronym is Pennsylvania, Jersey, Maryland, but it actually encompasses more states. So that's about as north as Jersey, not as north as a Boston, sorry, Izzy. About as south as like North Carolina and then west is Illinois. We go over to Chicago. So the states within the PJM energy grid, large energy users, such as actually a William & Mary, which I've talked to before, or a Huntington Ingalls industry, or a large retail store, such as the Walmarts that might be within the PJM energy grid, all of those are committed, considered demand assets because of the amount of energy they use. So it would be my job to call them to reach out and try to get them signed up for these programs so they could provide some of their flexible load to the grid. Moving to the part-time role, uh, I have the force of serving on the Williamsburg City Council. I'm coming up on about two years now, which has really flown by, especially as the first 
year and a half, we didn't get to see our colleagues as very much. I'm sure Ted can, can uh, Ted and everyone on this call can resonate with that. So now that we're back in person, we're unmasking a little bit, it's a very exciting time to be on the city council. I'll first speak a little bit towards what we've done in the past to be an environmentally friendly city, and then a little bit towards what I think we could move towards in the future. So in the past, Williamsburg, to contextualize a little bit, as you all know, very small city, about 15,000 people, nine square miles. But despite our small size, we have been rated highly for a few different areas in our environmental friendly uh, space. The first is we were rated for the 2017 to 2021 and likely for the 2022 to 2026 timeframe as one of Virginia's most bikeable cities. We were given the higher of the tiered rankings as we have been in that time frame moving towards bikeability as one way to encourage people to get around in ways that aren't necessarily through a, a gas powered vehicle. Rich, I'm sure you appreciate the new trail that got put in right on Monticello Avenue. And everyone who has seen it, Ted, you as well, I know you're at the ribbon cutting, now, now gets to ride on a multi-use trail that's removed from the street rather than that little, I mean, about this big two feet wide margin that was sometimes a, a dangerous place to walk or to ride a bike before we were able to put that in. So the city has in the past worked towards its bikeability. We also have, for those that that lived off campus, a robust recycling program. Uh, this time last year is the data that I could find before this, but we collected about 40 tons of recycling in March of 2021, which is around our rolling average for this time of year. And that's because every two weeks we have a recycling program that comes through. We provide one or two bins to houses, depending on their size, and make sure that we are encouraging our residents to recycle as they can. Also in our newly constructed buildings, most notably the Stryker Center where we have our city council meetings and the Municipal Center where we have uh, the majority of our city staff, both of those are LEED certified. That's L-E-E-D. There's an acronym in there somewhere, but it has to do with lights turning off when there's no motion in the building, same with water faucets and making sure that it can be as sustainable as it can with the building envelope as well and not having the, the heat or the AC as you pump it in erode from the building quickly. So both of those buildings have been LEED certified. Finally, we have EV chargers installed in a couple of places within the city, but as far as the actual uh, Williamsburg assets, we have them by our Quarter Path Recreation Center, and then also in the parking garage that is right behind our Chamber of Commerce that's, that's uh, pretty close to the Stryker Center. So there are a few different options for people to charge their electric vehicles within Williamsburg as well. That's what we have done in the past. We had in 2020, one of our biannual goal setting periods. We call those the GIOs, Goals, Initiatives, and Outcomes. That's the city's opportunity to come together with our council members, our department heads, our city manager, and decide what are some of the long-term goals that Williamsburg can have moving forward. One of the ones we recognized in trying to be an ambitious city and starting to talk about long-term plans of what Williamsburg looks like in 2040 is the real need to show ourselves as an ambitious place as far as uh, programs go addressing climate change. We've seen this kind of work from Charlottesville, from Blacksburg, from Norfolk. So we started to talk about what is the next environmental ladder, as we like to call it, that Williamsburg can climb as we work towards the new goals of environmental uh, sustainability. I think the best way to do that is by first quantifying our greenhouse gas emissions. And I took some time uh, with these goals to provide my recommendations to the city manager. And I'll actually be doing the same to the assistant city manager next week as she is going to overtake this project. The first thing that Charlottesville, those communities I mentioned, Loudon, Blacksburg did as they created new environmental uh, plans was to quantify their greenhouse gas emissions for that moment. And then the second step was the implementation of projects to lower those. So I did some research and found that there are a number of good organizations that are externally funded that a city can join and therefore through no or a very, very low cost to the locality receive expert advice on one, doing some of that data procurement ourselves and then actually implementing some of those projects. So the two that came to mind that I'll be talking with our assistant city manager, Michelle DeWitt, about are GHG protocol, that's greenhouse gas protocol. Both of these are, are easily found online. The greenhouse gas protocol 
help cities and localities quantify, well, what's the emissions from your uh, municipal assets? What's the emissions from the main roadways that you might have? And then we would partner with the second organization, CDP. I tried for the life of me to find what that acronym was and couldn't, but CDP, which lists themselves as a global environmental disclosure system to actually put in some projects in mind to try to lower some of our emissions level. Usually that is done as a part of a 30 to 40 year plan or, or 20 to 30 year plan, I should say, as the communities that in Virginia, the ones I've listed have put these plans in place to try to adhere to the original intent of the Paris Climate Accords of reaching zero emissions by 2050. And ideally, if possible, half of those 50% by 2030. That's generally where I think Williamsburg could move. And in trying to climb this next ladder of environmentalism, our assistant city manager, Michelle, has convened our department heads to come together and to talk about how they can have more environmental projects within their departments. So I'm excited to talk to her uh, next week, but I'll also mention as a shout out to William and Mary and students that really care about the environment there. I got in touch with, or I should say they got in touch with me, students who are representing the group PIRG, P-I-R-G, that were interested in pursuing an environmental project locally. They thought a really interesting allowance that cities had been given from this past general assembly year as the state level representatives of ours allow the city to uh, do certain things and not do certain things. One of the interesting new things that cities are now allowed to do is to tax the single use plastic bags within a locality. So we'll have actually today at 345, a conversation between myself and, and Michelle DeWitt and those couple of students who have done a little bit of research into how other communities have put this tax in place to de-incentivize the use of single-use plastics. As I think about that in Williamsburg, I'll, I'll be really excited to see their research. I wonder how we could specialize it so that maybe the, the singly owned mom and pop stores that might use single-use plastic bags might not have a tax levied on them, but like other localities, we could say, well, if you're a chain establishment, such as a food line, which is right down the road from me, then maybe this tax, which is, which is negligible, maybe this tax would actually apply to you. And I feel like a little bit, I've been the um, beneficiary maybe, or maybe the world has been the beneficiary of seeing this tax put on me to some ways. I shop at Aldi's. I don't know if anyone else shops at Aldi's. It is the best place. Um, great food, cheap wine, just a really wonderful place to shop. They require you to, well, they don't require you, I should say, but they sell you bags and you can buy new ones every time you go. They're, they're pretty cheap. They're 10 cents a bag, which over the course of a year would maybe add up to something. But in comparison to, I shop once a week, you know, $70 grocery run isn't all that much, but it has now conditioned me to keep those bags. And I, and I bought them back when I started shopping at Aldi over a year ago, and now I keep them in the back of my car and in that way have never needed to keep buying the single use plastic bags and then tossing them in the trash as I might have at Food Lion when I was shopping as a student. So a good example of how a little bit of a push in that direction, helping people recognize, hey, there is a negative um, externality to using something like a plastic use single use bag, then they might recognize, all right, well, I'll, I'll use paper or I'll just bring my own bags. Third and finally is volunteer work because of actually the sustainability newsletter that comes out weekly. And because of actually Sophie, who put this on the newsletter way back in, I guess it would have been November of 2020, uh, I applied for and ended up receiving a position on the GYCN, which is the Global Youth Climate Network. This is an organization uh, run by the Y to Y, which is youth to youth group within the World Bank. And it brings together environmentally minded representatives from their home countries. We had about 100 people representing one, I'm sorry, we had 140 people representing 100 countries. And I was able to, through that process, take regular classes on a weekly basis around, well, how can we address sea level rise? How can we try to decarbonize the energy sector? How can we make things like steel and plastic more sustainably? But our uh, fellows were also challenged to have three environmental projects. So on a volunteer side, I tried to wonder, well, what can I do locally? What can I do broader as my three projects as a part of this GYCN fellowship? The three I chose were 
writing that distilled bit of information for our city manager and now for our assistant city manager and how Williamsburg can climb the next environmental uh, ladder of ours for our goals. The second was holding a number of talks at our local library where we brought in a member of the James City County, Clean County Commission and spoke about little things that people could do residentially to uh, live more sustainably. It's, such as planting pollinators outside, you know, making sure that they are not only recycling, but also composting. We had three of those sessions. And then the third and final one was trying to go and, and ultimately succeeding and thankfully not being run over on a cross-state bike ride, which I was able to do in September of last year, going from my old hometown of Bristol, Virginia, back here to Williamsburg over the course of about 480 miles, uh, around 70 a day, and ended up in doing an effort like that, wanting to partner with an organization. So we were fortunate to raise $5,755, which ended up at 115% of goal for the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. That's part-time work and full-time work and volunteer work. I, I really think I found climate change as a passion of mine and maybe a life passion of mine because of a William Mary class called Global Climate Change run by Nick Palacio, if, if anyone may know him, I'm sure some people do. And since then, it's been a, a driver of mine and a great reason to wake up in the morning. So I was excited to come here and, and talk a little bit about the experience, but I will pause there for any questions or discussion. That was awesome. Thank you, Caleb. <laughs> but yeah, I have a couple of questions, but I'll open it up to everyone else. If you want to share any comments or it seems like a lot of you have worked with Caleb. So that's, that's pretty awesome. Love the support, but I'll leave it to you all first. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't pack the crowd, Sophie. So I, I wasn't going for any softball questions here. I will ask, hey, Caleb, it's good to see you. Uh, in terms of solar energy for the city, is there any, um, and working with the county as well, is there any combined um, groups or uh, efforts to try and make that more um, financially viable and uh, more uh, popular, if you will? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, William and Mary, as you know, is trying to procure their energy from renewable sources. So I've been able to talk to Kalandra Waters Lake about some of the challenges there. And similarly, in some of our buildings that we've constructed, um, right now you've probably seen there's a fire department going up. We recently put up the new, not we, but a private developer put up the new apartments at Midtown Row. I've questioned, well, you know, can, can these brand new roofs hold solar? Some of the limitations I've found, at least within the city, are that putting solar on a place usually requires a 25 year lease. So if there was a large space, a food line, let's say, that could potentially have solar on the roof, they might run into some developmental difficulties in needing it to repair their roof within 10 years. And then some that I've found uh, not as encouragingly on the Midtown Row space thought that, well, for this, the, the area that they had on their roofs, the procurement of solar energy from those panels wouldn't be wouldn't make economic sense for them because they're not able to pull as much from the solar panels as as you might think. I mean, using Midtown Row as an example, this will be the roughest of estimates, but you know, it, it might be like five to ten percent of their overall energy usage that they could get from solar on their rooftops. So I say that not to say solar can't work here because solar has been been proven to work in a lot of places. But I think in our partnerships with James City County, which we do for a lot of things, um, emergency management services, our fire department partners with them, they respond coordinatingly multiple times a week. We also have a joint school district with them. There are some potential investments in the larger land area that James City County has. They're about 10 times the size of Williamsburg, around 90 square miles, where we could look at solar as a part of some of our larger developments. One of those which will go in soon, actually, or, or that Williamsburg expressed an interest in and, and has put up a little bit of a financial interest in is a area that's meant for drone usage. This will be our, our, our way to try to bring in some 
high tech and high wage jobs into the area, while it won't be within the nine square miles of Williamsburg, it will be in James City County. So a number of localities have put some funding towards the construction of this uh, base, so to speak, but it's on a larger swath of land and we're looking at putting solar on another part of it because companies will, if you have a large amount of land, just pay you for letting them use it for solar and you'll get a check every month, which can be good. And then they usually procure that back onto the grid as an asset that they pay, just as the grid would pay Dominion Energy. So long story made short, uh, yes, there are definitely opportunities for solar locally. We usually approach that in partnership with our other localities as they have a great amount of developable land. Hey, Joe. Yeah, great to be with you all and I learned a lot. Um, <clears throat> just last week, I guess, drove by again where the, the demolition of the old fire station has mm -hmm. occurred and it's all flat. Uh, what's, what's the plan with the uh, new building for the fire station? Any sustainable things that are in there, you know, solar, whatever, and the, the, new, the new plan for the fire station? Yeah, as, as I understand it, that station actually might not be LEED certified. I asked the developer the same thing is, is, well, what would be the reason to not pursue lead certification? And as I understand it, the rebates that were put around receiving the, the gold, silver, copper and platinum levels have been reduced in years past. So they found it better or, or better pursued to use those funds that might go towards the lead certification and just put them into already best building practices. There will be a lot of the pieces of what goes into lead certification in that building. You know, I, I, I mentioned making sure that the, the building has a solid envelope so that there isn't um, easily the escapage of heat or cool air as you're heating it and cooling it. And then such things as uh, lights that are on a timer or faucets that are on a timer will also be included. But I think it is actually not planning to be lead certified. And, and I know there's not going to be solar on the roof. Hey, Richard. Hey, Caleb, great presentation as always, all the work you do. So, so appreciate all that you do for the community and William and Mary still. So thank you for that first and foremost. As you know, Caleb, one of the big things that I believe in that sustainability, wellness, and tourism can go hand in hand. And I think particularly Williamsburg and James City County is uniquely positioned to market those concepts in association with programs and possibly other infrastructure projects. I would kind of like to hear your position, how William and Mary can continue to support these concepts as well as an administrator that advises students. And what can I do as a citizen further to promote those concepts, to build a, a, a different type of growth and a different type of marketing model for our community that promotes health, wellness, recreation, tourism, and ecotourism. Yeah, well, thanks very much for the question, Richard. I'd say you're already doing a lot right now as a, as a member of the board trying to pursue the boat trail coming to Williamsburg and coming through Williamsburg, and then and also just teaching students how they can bike around campus easily, but also bike and, and get them to the Virginia Capitol Trail easily. So for those others on the call who might not know what we're talking about and who also want to give some, some commendations to Richard for his work to make sure that areas are, are bikeable, there is a wonderful trail that we've probably all heard about, the Virginia Capitol Trail, 52 miles that goes from Richmond, Virginia to Williamsburg, Virginia, and, and it ends right at the Jamestown, Yorktown Foundation. That's where the, the literally mile zero sign is. Well, there are discussions of creating a boat trail, B-O-A-T, the acronym being Birthplace of America Trail that would connect Richmond to Williamsburg already through the Capitol Trail and then connect Williamsburg to Jamestown. And we would like to see this trail come through the city of Williamsburg, potentially even past William and Mary on a street like a, a, a Jamestown or a Richmond Road so that you can connect those larger assets. But the good reason for doing so on top of you know, just, just biking is for anyone who's been on the Capitol Trail, you recognize pretty quickly, the farther you go out, there are whole businesses that will seemingly be in, in the middle of nowhere that have a huge biking community that are there grabbing a beer in the afternoons or drinking a bit of coffee in the mornings. There is a great amount of tourism that can be provided from the cycling community or just general multi-use trails in an area. 
A good example of this is the Swamp Rabbit Trail in Greenville, South Carolina that, that Rich told me about originally, which has provided a lot of travel, actual foot travel and cycling travel along a business area of Greenville. So the idea of the boat trail would be people from a Richmond or a Jamestown would maybe say, well, I don't want to drive into Williamsburg, but I'd love to bike into Williamsburg and eat lunch there and then bike back later that day. I think to answer your question, Rich, that would be one of the best ways we can promote that sort of um, tourism based around athleticism uh, as one way to put it by connecting the Capitol Trail, which truly ends just at Jamestown to, I should say the foundation that is, to Jamestown and finding a way to bring that through the city of Williamsburg. Thank you, Caleb. Thank you for the work you do. Hey, Ted, good I've to see you. I've got a couple comments if, if we have time. What was that? I have a couple comments if we have time. Yeah, please jump in. Uh, for, for those who may not know him, although I'm sure many do, Ted Maslin is a city councilor uh, as well with me. He graduated from UVA undergrad and William & Mary for his business degree, and we're fortunate to have him in the city now serving on council. Uh, thanks. Yeah, so 15 years ago, I was uh, a division director at the city of Seattle. And uh, back then, we, we were probably leading the, the nation in a lot of different initiatives, one of which is sustainability. The other one is, was typically emergency medicine. Um, but we were I was fortunate to be there when we were redesigning, renovating, or replacing 32 of our 35, of our 33 fire stations. And I was a, a lead associate back then. And we would have, before every design, we'd have a, 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 a sustainability charrette where we would actually go through, uh, you know, what, we, what can we do to uh, have uh, sustainability uh, features in, in the project, which was, was really great. Um, also, sustainability was always at the forefront of everything we did, whether it was design or operations. Uh, we had we were probably leading the nation back there in the use of gray water. So in our restrooms, you know, it, it would be uh, it wouldn't be fresh water; it would be uh, recycled water. In fact, uh, we're probably were leading the nation in terms of how do we update our plumbing codes because the plumbing codes actually did not even allow it back then. Uh, the other good thing about being in Seattle was. Uh, we had probably the cheapest electric rates was hydroelectric power. Uh, so that was, that was really great. Um, the, uh, getting back to Williamsburg. So last spring, uh, as you, most of you know, there's sometimes some friction within our historic uh, neighborhoods next to William and Mary. And so I was able to schedule a, uh, a walkthrough on a Sunday with uh, some of the students from the Student Assembly uh, Sustainability Committee and some of our long-term residents there to talk about how can we get students, student residents, off-campus residents, and long-term residents to sort of work together on common ground. And, and I saw that sustainability and recycling programs could, could be a part of that. So one of the things that I really like about what William Mary is doing is the composting. Uh, and so one of the initiatives I'd like to continue to work on is how do we get a pilot project off campus uh, using the composting ideas that we see on campus. And I've had some preliminary discussions and I'm thinking that the perfect place for this is a place where A, we've got 600 students living in one location off campus and B, we've got a restaurant that sells a lot of pizza in, in Williamsburg. Because just think of you know being able to recycle through composting all these pizza boxes that we can't recycle now uh, within the city in terms of normal recycling. And then the Kayla mentioned the PIRG uh, single-use uh, plastic. They, the group also, I, I talked with them also. And uh, so 10 years ago, I was living in the city of Los Angeles. We actually had an ordinance where it, the uh, grocery stores could not use plastic bags. Mm -hmm. And they could use the paper bags, but they would have to charge the customer 10 cents per paper bag. And that the money stayed within the store. So it was more of them, it wasn't a tax uh, revenue for the, for the city. But that worked out pretty well and it actually changed behavior. So for example, I would actually typically take uh, in my own basket and shop there and then and not use any bags for that. Uh, I concur with what uh, Caleb's saying about Aldi's and, and Aldi's I'll either take a basket or I'll, I'll recycle one of the boxes 
I mean, you can just pick up a box there and take, take your groceries home in the box and then recycle the box. Now, one of the things I was recommending to the students with PIRG is to, for a program to, like that to work, it really needs to be regional, you know, not just the city. It needs to be the counties all in on that. And also taking a look at, would it be better to use the carrot approach versus the stick? Why don't we start recognizing the, uh, the stores that are, are, are uh, you know, the best examples of it? being the Aldi's, like Earth Fair. Earth Fair only uses a mm -hmm. paper. They don't have any plastic. So maybe if we could sort of make them the champions of sustainability and encourage the residents and students to actually shop there as maybe a, a first step. Uh, so that's all I had. Perfect. Well, any other questions from Jennifer or Anusha or Sophie? Otherwise, we can give some people some time back for their lunch. I noticed folks have not been eating. I had a question about recycling in Williamsburg, and I don't know whether this is like related to the Executive Order 77 that Northam put out, or whether this is just like a Williamsburg thing, but last semester, um, I decided I probably don't know how to recycle and compost properly, so I should do some research. And in that research, I learned that in the city of Williamsburg, you can only recycle plastics labeled ones and twos, which is super limiting um, and kind of, I don't know, made me a little bit upset because I had been living this lie where I was like, oh my gosh, I can recycle everything from ones through sevens and plastics, aluminum, all of that. Um, but I was wondering if you knew why this was the case or if there are any programs to kind of expand what types of plastics that can be recycled. I know that William & Mary also, um, starting in March, limited what plastics can and can't be recycled. Um, but I know after talking to a couple of other people who are interested in sustainability, we're all just a little bit confused. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't know if you could speak a little bit to that. So first, could you tell me, so the governor's executive order that you mentioned, 77, what does that do? So that is an executive order to limit single-use plastics. Okay. Um, I don't know if I can accurately um, describe all of the kind of requirements and goals of the executive order, but I know there was actually a sustainable, I want to say two months ago on it. Um, and the larger focus right now is to eliminate single use plastic bags um, and like utensils and stuff. But that's like the gist of um, the order. Yeah, well, my short I answer is- I would like to give you a jump of the executive order. Uh, it's just the governor last year, um, the ex-governor has issued an executive order requiring all the state agencies to need to eliminate single-use plastic items purchasing yeah. from the procurement point of standpoint, uh, and uh, which does include utensils, uh, uh, even the these are uh, all kind of plastic items from one to seven that we see in the dining areas, though the uh, as well as uh, the utensils and all. So there is a list of items. So it's like a phase level elimination by 2025 uh, by 100% purchase reduction because that's an achievement on source reduction rather than increasing and focusing on the recycling practice. Mm -hmm. So to that executive order, Wilman Mary has uh, from the uh, from the top management, from the CEO uh, has uh, lined up and been working on those kind of initiatives with the support of procurement to just give an overview of lens on it. Anusha, that was really helpful. Thank you very much for that description. It makes sense you try to tackle that from the source rather than, and I, I wasn't sure if that was the expansion of what could be recycled. Um, Sophie, that's a question I'd like to look more into. I wasn't aware that we might have only certain numbers that were allowable or not. Uh, Williamsburg has a regional contract for our recycling as we do for our trash. So that's likely going to a recycling sorting center that has the same stipulations for other localities on the peninsula. But I'd love to look more into it and I can email you and, and others on the call who might be interested as well. Ted, did you have a point there? Sure, yeah. Uh, hey, so so uh, I went to the UVA William Mary baseball game a couple of weeks ago and their concessions, uh, they did not. Uh, they did not have any straws, and they did not have any plastic caps for their. But they did sell alcohol, <laughs> uh, which we don't do at our baseball games. But the uh, back to the recycling question. 
so this was very confusing, uh, not to just uh, you, but many people. And it, it was, uh, it was, it really came to a head when. Uh, so we have a a monthly interview on WMBG. Someone from City Council talking about what we did in the last meeting, and so does James City County. And I remember when that was being rolled out, that the James City County supervisor said that that morning he had an argument with his wife as to what could be recycled and he lost. <laughs> uh, and as it relates to plastics, basically the rule, the new rule is it has to have, it has to be, have a neck like a bottle. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the reason for that is uh, as Caleb was saying that the, the recycling uh, processing, uh, it was a lot of changes back uh, in China that they were not accepting what we were sending over there. And, and in terms of what can be processed. So it, it doesn't make sense to most people because uh, you would think you'd be able to recycle anything plastic, but but that's not the case. So, uh, and, and to our credit uh, as a city, we've maintained that recycling is a basic, uh, basic uh, city service. And we, uh, whereas there are other cities and some of the counties that don't see it as a basic service. They'll charge you for it if you elect to have it. And there's at least one city in Hampton Roads that decided not to do anything at all mm -hmm. because it is costing a lot more uh, than it did before. Uh, so now, and then back to the uh, uh, the executive order. I think in addition to uh, talking about the, the uh, plastic bags, Kayla, can you mention about that ordinance that we had that in terms of uh, not allowing plastic containers for food? Yeah, so there's going to be an ordinance that's similarly, as Anusha said, rolled out progressively until 2025 that would have the fine based around large businesses or particularly restaurants that give out to-go containers in the form of a styrofoam to-go container. And so that's one thing the city has looked at is as we move towards that, what, where does that revenue go that we might have from a tax? And it's, as I understand it, going towards a green fund just as with the single use plastic bag tax, it isn't something that we put in place to try to create new revenue for the city. As I mentioned, it's a, it's a very negligible tax, more meant to push people in the right direction, but that is also stipulated that any revenue from it would also go into a green fund for the city. Green fund just having the, uh, the, the control on it that it has to go towards some kind of environmental project. So, well, thank you for that clarification. That was, I definitely forgot about the whole China not purchasing plastics anymore part. Um, Isn't that a, a really interesting macro look at the, the economy yeah. around recyclables? You, you, you'd think they're easier to get rid of, but there does have to be someone buying. Definitely. Well, I think if no one else has any questions, like Caleb said, maybe we'll give you back some time for an actual lunch break. Um, but thank you all so much for coming. Thank you, Caleb, for sharing more about your work. That was really, really awesome. And the questions were great. The answers to the questions were awesome. Um, so this could not have gone any better. <laughs> thank you all so much again. I really appreciate your time. And Sophie, happy birthday. Thank you. See you all. Bye.